All right, I know more people will log in, but let's go ahead and in the interests of time and um, in gratitude to our panelists, let's go ahead and begin. My name is Dave Feldman. I wanna welcome you to Cows, Crops in the Colorado, Thirsty Practices in a Time of Crisis. Again, this is our first Water UCI Speaking of Water Colloquium for the year. Uh, as you all know, the unprecedented decline of the Colorado River has precipitated a crisis affecting the people and ecology that rely on this vital water source. Addressing the causes and consequences of sustained reduction in the Colorado River, coupled with climate uncertainties, requires long-term cooperation and collaboration among many stakeholders. To this end, this colloquium convenes representatives from diverse backgrounds, as you'll learn in a moment, in what we believe will be a thoughtful discourse on these enduring challenges. I wanna thank a number of people for making this possible. I wanna thank uh, Shannon Roback, our former Associate Director of Water UCI, who initially arranged this panel. Chandok Gim, my current Associate Director of Water UCI for arranging all of the logistics. The School of Social Ecology at UCI, where uh, our center, Water UCI, is housed for all of its support. And last but not least, our many Speaking of Water series sponsors from throughout the region. Thank you for your support. We're gonna begin by asking each panelist to briefly provide a uh, perspective on the Colorado crisis. This will be followed by a round table in which I'll pose a series of questions that the panelists have already seen. Time permitting then, we'll move to audience questions. On your Zoom platform, you'll see a Q&A box at the bottom. Please go ahead and put your questions in there and we'll get through as many of them as we can. I uh, wanna introduce the panel. Uh, Bill Hazenkamp, manager of the Colorado River Resources for the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, where he develops and manages water supply programs to augment the Met's Colorado River supplies. Welcome, Bill, great to have you. Thank you. Uh, A.G. Kawamura is a third generation produce grower and shipper from Orange County, California. From 2003 to 2010, he served as secretary of the California Department of Food and Agriculture, and he's founding co-chair of Solutions from the Land, a nationally recognized nonprofit that's developing innovative and sustainable climate smart collaborations for 21st century agriculture. Brian Richter has been a global leader in water science and conservation for more than 30 years. He's the president of Sustainable Waters, a global organization focused on water scarcity challenges, where he promotes sustainable water use and management with governments, corporations, universities, and local communities. And Brian also serves as a senior freshwater fellow at the World Wildlife Fund. And last but not least, Dr. Christy Wickoff is the owner operator of Red Wing Ranch, a regenerative cattle ranch in Southern Colorado on the Eastern slope of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. As a wildlife ecologist, Christie's career is focused on wildlife conservation and ecological land management skills that she's now using to move Red Wing Ranch from con conventional to regenerative grazing practices. Again, my thanks to all of you. Uh, really looking forward to your remarks. And let's begin, as I said, with a, a brief perspective from each of you. Uh, Brian, let's begin with you. Sure. Well, thanks, David. And, um, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, the, the, the short version of my bio is that I've been working on water issues, water problems all around the world for, I guess, more than 40 years now. And, and um, saw the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know, during that time. And, and during the last, you know, decade, I really started to hone in on water scarcity. I really thought that that was sort of the, well, a very, very challenging issue, obviously, and um, and needs a lot of attention. And so I've I've been I've been working on on those issues almost exclusively now for the last decade. And uh, I grew up in Southern California, actually, even though I live in Central Virginia right now. And um, I can remember back in the 70s, you know, of having mandatory water conservation, you know, in, in the city of San Diego back then. Uh, but I have to say that I never thought that my home river, and I do think of the Colorado River that way, I never thought that my home river would sort of end up in the state that it's in today. And, um, and, I'm, and I'm very concerned about it. And uh, not just for 
the people who depend upon that river system, but also, you know, I spent three decades leading the global water program for the Nature Conservancy. And, and obviously, you know, as a conservation organization, we're very, you know, very attuned to what's happening to the, uh, the non-human uh, dependence of river systems like the Colorado. And, and um, they're under a lot of, you know, they're, they're quite imperiled and they're under a lot of stress. And so I, I guess I'll just conclude by saying that, um, boy, there's, there's an awful lot at stake, obviously. And, um, and I, among many, many others, are, are trying to offer, you know, thoughts and help in any way that we can. And we're wishing Bill and the other negotiators that are working on those Colorado River issues the best of luck. It's, uh, it's a really, really wonderful place and, um, and very important to everybody. So thanks. Thank you, Brian. Bill, as a person involved in the negotiations, let's go to you next. Thank you. For the last 16 years, there's been rules that have managed the Colorado River Basin that have provided stability for the seven states and the country of Mexico. We've negotiated rules that allow Southern California to store water in Lake Mead in wet years here locally, to take out in dry years. We've developed agreements to transfer water around from agricultural agencies to urban entities and even fund conservation in Mexico. And Mexico participates in shortages along with the lower basin. All of those agreements <clears throat> are set to end in 2026. And a new set of generational agreements will determine the future of the Colorado River. We have the next two and a half years to determine what the Colorado River is gonna look like how are people's lives? How will we view lawns in the next generation? How will we continue to grow crops and feed the nation and the world? What kind of changes will we need to make? What kind of flows will we have in the river? All that is at stake in the next two and a half years through a very public process that everyone can be a part of. And as, uh, well, I can talk about all the successes of the past, uh, Simon Sinek sums it up with his quote, the challenge of the unknown future is so much more exciting than the stories of the accomplished past. And that unknown future, a lot of that's gonna be decided in the next two and a half years. Thank you, Bill. Uh, let's go ahead and go to A.G. Kawamura. Thank you, David, and uh, greetings everybody. Uh, I'm a third generation farmer in Orange County um, and you can imagine the course of a lifetime. I've been, uh, I've seen, I guess, about 45 uh, different seasons under my belt. And in the, those many years, we, we've seen just tremendous changes in, in, in Southern California. Uh, obviously, the urbanization of one of the greatest farming regions ever, ever put together in the, in the world. Um, this Mediterranean climate that we have has been a wonderful opportunity to grow a lot of things. But it's also people like to live where the plants like to grow. And so when, when you look at the future and the current dependence on all the different water resources that do exist in our area, uh, we've done a really amazingly uh, um, resilient job of pulling together uh, a lot of technology, a lot of thinking, a lot of engineering, and recognizing that we were always a desert area to begin with. Uh, the development of, of a water infrastructure that actually has gotten us not only to today and into the foreseeable future, that's an accomplishment that you can't ignore. Uh, obviously, with us, I'm an irrigated agriculturalist. We farm and we irrigate to get the different vegetable crops we have in the Midwest. And in, uh, you have 80 percent of the agriculture in the Midwest is rain fed. We hope it rains enough or not too much. In Africa, you hear that it's 90, 95 percent of all the agriculture in Africa is rain fed. You hope it rains enough to get a crop and you hope it doesn't rain too much to lose the crop. Um, I've lost crops to floods. I've lost crops to drought saltwater intrusion in the dry years um, where my well goes dry. I've, I've had all those different experiences and we always basically say the simple statement, no water, no food. Um, and the minute that you have unpredictable uh, water supplies, you end up with unpredictable harvest. And so this issue of what's happening with our water supply, the dependence we have in California on the Colorado system, uh, dependence we have on uh, in our specific, specific area, on that water coming in, but also then the rec reclamation use of it, the water reuse, uh, which has been a, a staple part of our water supply in agriculture for the last 20, 30 years um, plus, 
Um, we recognize that water resources, you have to be thinking forward. You can't be just on a day-to-day -day, uh, assuming that things are getting done. Uh, to build resilient systems, you need to be thinking way in the future. Currently, based upon just the the unpredictable, we were when when this session was uh, put together eight, seven, eight months ago, we were in a severe drought. And look in what look what happens with a, an amazing water year, uh, the blessings of an amazing water year and uh, summer monsoon as well that seems unprecedented, uh, unprecedented as well. And so we recognize that with these changes, we get maybe to push the pause button and talk about what is our water future, how prepared are we for these enormous swings in water production and water, water capture, and more importantly, what are we going to do about it now that we've had a, a little time to understand just how severe uh, our situation will be when the water does run dry. So right. I, I look forward to this conversation. Thank you for that. Christy, your perspective. I come at this as uh, as a water user. I've lived in four different states across the West and um, know the different um, kind of politics of water in each place as a resident. And then in California, I worked uh, on a large property where we didn't, we just used range um, pasture for our cattle. And out here, we've got a mix of range pasture and irrigated pasture. Um, so kind of having seen it in a couple of different ways, um, I generally see the water issue through an ecological and land management element. So I think that um, while the administration of water is super important and hugely complex, I think one of the fears that I have, one of the reasons I'm always interested in talking about these is that we've gotten so focused on the administration and the conservation and the technology that will help us get through this, that we're kind of missed the larger opportunities at landscape levels, watershed management, forest health, rangeland management, tools that we've got, and, and I'll speak more about regenerative grazing, but that can be widely applied to really increase the water retention in the system to create long-term storage that benefits us on the long run um, and also has all kinds of climate benefits on top of it. So I really, I come at all of these, whether it's thinking about how we want to manage invasives in one of our pastures to, you know, thinking about watersheds and how, you know, compact decisions, river compact decisions on, say, the Arkansas, which is the river that we're part of the watershed, how those affect the end user, but how the end users can actually also be a part of the solution. So I look forward to today's conversation. All right, excellent. Thank you, panelists. So I uh, want to go on to our uh, first question. And as we do pose questions to the panelists, Again, those of you in the audience, we do have a Q&A box. Feel free to add any queries that you have as we go along, and we'll definitely uh, address those at the end of our discussion. Uh, our first question, and uh, again, kind of stretch out and think about this in any way you'd like to. Uh, negotiations between lower basin states, Arizona, California, Nevada, have been ongoing for some time on the Colorado. Uh, are you optimistic that an equitable and an effective reallocation agreement can be finalized? And why or why are you not optimistic about that? Uh, and uh, why don't we go ahead and start with you, Brian, your thoughts on that? Sure, David. Well, I have to admit I'm of two very, very different minds on this on this question. Um, maybe you can call it the reservoir half full and the reservoir half empty. Um, but so on that dark side, on the pessimistic side, I, I guess it's just, um, you know, over the over the last 20, 22 years, 23 years, we've had a series of agreements, um, at least four among the lower basin states and at least two between the United States and Mexico. And yet we still are in a situation where those solutions still haven't been at the scale and at the ambitious level adequate to be able to really address, you know, the, the problem, you know, the, at the level that it needs to be dealt with. And I think that's evidenced by the fact that um, last year, the Bureau of Reclamation Commissioner Camille Tutan um, said, um, you know, she was she was asking the 
she was asking the lower basin states specifically to try to come up with savings of two to four million acre feet of additional savings. And the lower basin states, you know, through a lot of effort, and Bill can tell you a lot more about this, but came back with with essentially a million acre feet per year for each of the next three years. So this is this is emblematic of the fact that we keep trying to rise to the occasion, rise to the challenge, and yet we keep coming up short. And the climate scientists are warning us that this problem is only going to get bigger and bigger over time. So that's my that's my kind of um, pessimistic is uh, show me, you know, show me a solution adequate to the scale of the problem. And I sure hope, Bill, again, I'll say it. I sure hope that you guys can can come up with a solution that really gets to that proper scale where we're and what I mean by that, just to be very clear, where we're balancing the use of the river uh, with the available water supplies. And of course, at the same time, taking into consideration the ecological needs of the river system as well, and making sure that all of the dependence on the river, human dependence on the river system, including the Native American tribes, are being adequately considered um, in these in these decisions. The the the, the half full um, side, David, is really. Uh, there's great examples around the world. You know, I mentioned that I, you know, I worked all over the world, 40 different countries. Um, there's a lot of great examples of frameworks that work, uh, of transboundary river and aquifer systems where they have been able to put into place some of the essential elements of sustainable long-term management, um, been able to bring the use under control and, and in commensurate with, with how much water is available or how much is being recharged into the aquifers. And so I'm hopeful uh, that this that this 2026 negotiation, as Bill mentioned a, a moment ago, I'm really hopeful that rather than continued reactive incrementalism that comes up short of the work that needs to be done, of the solution that needs to be put into place, I really hope we can tackle this thing in its entirety and and put a solution in place that people can rely on and that people can you know, with, with the with the reactionary incrementalism, what happens is every, you know, every year, or every couple of years, you know, we get a new level of cuts being imposed on the lower basin states. Um, and that's not a great way to manage a river system. It's not a great way to manage um, a water resource because people can't plan around, you know, a, around a future that's constantly changing so frequently year to year and or every couple of years. And the last thing I'll say is, um, David, you asked the question as a lower basin focused question. I think this is really a whole basin uh, question, right? Um, that really there needs to be a solution put into place that covers the entirety of the basin and then covers the two subunits, the upper basin and the lower basin. And um, I hope we can get those frameworks into place and, and, and th that they're durable and adequate for the long term. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate that. Bill, your uh, perspectives on this. Thank you. A hundred years ago, last Thanksgiving, the seven states came together and did something remarkable. They got together in Santa Fe and developed a compact that for the Colorado River, something that had never been done on that scale to manage a river that goes through two countries and seven states and said, we are going to create our own destiny. We're not gonna have the federal government tell us how we're gonna manage our river. We are going to manage it ourselves. That has been the model of the Colorado River for the last hundred years and eight months. With the one exception was the Arizona versus California lawsuit. Uh, there was a dispute between Arizona and California. Arizona ended up winning that lawsuit and it really had to do with how tributary uses accounted for. And in Arizona's win, they got to use all of their tributaries and their full allocation from the river, essentially making them the largest user of Colorado River water in the basin. Um, that The other ramification of that lawsuit was the, that the federal government then became the water master of the lower basin. And the lower get basin gave up some of its uh, uh, autonomy. I can't say it. Some of his control <laughs> over the uh, over our waters, and we have to now deal with reclamation in the lower basin. But another thing that happened as part of that process was Arizona wanted to build the Central Arizona project. California still had one ace up its sleeve, and that was 
in order for Congress to approve building of the CAP, uh, a provision was put in that said Arizona and the Central Arizona Project are junior to all of California. Arizona accept, reluctantly accepted that deal, had the federal government build the Central Arizona Project. And since 1968, Arizona has been junior to California. And that's guided the agreements over the last 60 plus years. And we've been, again, in consensus over the last 30 years, reaching agreements on how we, how we sh share shortages. That is not California. And essentially, California has the highest right of water in the basin of all six states, because all seven states, because of that action. But we saw earlier this year the other six states challenging California and put together a proposal that essentially takes California's super priority away and distributes evaporation losses proportionally. So there was a fight between California saying, no, we have a priority system. We're willing to participate, but we're not going to give up our high priority for nothing. That led to a bitter, bitter struggle in the media and in the press this spring. The wet year, I think, kind of put a damper on the fight. And the lower basin came together in May and put together this plan that Brian alluded to. It's actually 750,000 acre feet a year over four years on top of shortages, which are another 750. So it's about a million and a half acre feet a year total over four years. And modeling says that that is enough to get us through 2026. So the short term is no longer the issue. The question is, what are the future agreements going to look like? We know that the imbalance is as a minimum a million and a half, two million acre feet. How are we going to share that with Arizona? Those are discussions that are going on now. In fact, there's a meeting with Arizona just next week to talk about how we can do that. California is willing to put water on the table out of its priority system, but we're not going to do it for free. We need flexibility. We need other provisions in order to reach some closure. So am I optimistic? History says yes. Despite this bump of the last six months, I do think we'll get there because the stakes are too high to go the litigation route, which is the other alternative, which really does, we learned in Arizona versus California, there are unanticipated consequences when that happens. So I think we'll get there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. A.G. Kawamura. When you look at the history of, of how we go about things, uh, I, I always like to give a a Mark Twain quote. It's not about whiskey. It, it's it's the quote that he has. You can't trust um, your judgment if your imagination is out of focus. Uh, we're here in the 21st century. Uh, the tools we have to work with are different than they were 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 80 years ago, 20 years ago. And with that access to a different toolbox, a different understanding of what we're trying to accomplish. There's a handful of things that we seem to be ignoring, but we really need to put our 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 our, our goggles on and, and look at the whole system and a little bit differently. We we have a crisis at the headwaters of the Colorado River, uh, where if that's broken, you can't assume that anything's going to be better over the long run if the headwaters are is broken and we can't save water as it falls, as it melts up there. And yet we have invasive species. Uh, if there's a, a challenge for the world right now, interestingly, invasive species comes up to should be at the very top of the list, because whether it's a uh, cheatgrass in the desert or whether it's invasive uh, um, uh, pine bark, uh, actually, they're, they're not really invasive species out there, pine, pine bark beetles. But when you have a sick forest and it's but most of it's dead wait, waiting to burn, you recognize that we have a limited amount of time to fix some things that are fixable and some dollars that could be re-diverted to try and at least get us to a point where the maximum amount of water that might be able to be saved is at least starting to be saved uh, given the rain, uh, unpredictable rainfall that we have. And, and then when we talk about infrastructure, obviously the improvement of the different canal systems, the different pieces of uh, infrastructure that have to be in place, new storage, new concepts for storage, aquifer replenishment, all of these are tools that are, are wonderfully available to us and they're starting to be put in place. We always recognize that we're in a crisis that tends to have uh, lead to knee-jerk reactions. Um, I, I mentioned we get to push the pause button because of this last six, seven months, and we have a little bit of space to just understand what's going to be the next steps for us to take. 
I had the pleasure of uh, taking a delegation down into Australia in year 10, 11 of their major drought um, uh, over a decade ago. Uh, we were shocked by what we saw. We, we saw a collapse of communities. We saw a complete uh, a collapse of different co commodity crops that were grown, uh, so much so that it actually affected the world supply of uh, wheat and, and, and rice at one point, the, leading to the Arab Spring. Um, challenges where where people can't even work all day and earn enough food uh, earn enough money to buy the food for the day this idea that agriculture is the one that is going to negotiate to lose less uh, i'd be the first to say boy that's about as stupid uh, a plan as anybody would ever want to put into play when we have a very complicated world that we need to feed eight billion people on the planet it is every region has to deal with its water supply every region has to deal with its resilience for unpredictable weather these days and I think what's challenging is when no one wants to understand the agricultural systems that exist on the watershed, uh, that's where I think one of our biggest challenges are. And I, I recognize that uh, uh, Christy was talking about that. Again, uh, overgrazing is bad. Uh, that doesn't mean all grazing is bad. Uh, gra you know, the ability to manage landscapes, large landscapes with animals, with other kinds of uh, forestry uh, uh, practices, these are all part of the uh, the playbook that we better put in place because we've learned the hard way over, over generations that uh, ignoring the past and not making those changes is probably uh, is myopic at best and it's it's uh, foolishness on, on, on the part of all of us that know better uh, and, and can't seem to collectively bring our voices to realign the resources to make some of these things uh, happen and start to put them in place uh, because time the clock's ticking. So uh, I, I look at that as we're part of the solution, those of us in agriculture, but it's unfortunate that many people don't quite see it that way. Thank you, AG. Christy, your perspective. Yeah, I'm generally an optimist, but I, I got to say I'm a little bit pessimistic. I'm kind of like Brian, I'm of two minds. Um, I don't think that we as a society have internalized the reality of the water on the ground right today, let alone wrapped our heads around the impacts of climate change and continued land use changes and how those are going to affect our water supply and and how our, our you know, our, our urban uh, footprints are changing too and how that changes the demand. Um, I also think it's really hard to have an equitable and effective reallocation agreement when parties are not always present in these conversations. So Brian mentioned the tribal nations that have significant water rights and Mexico, and um, they've only recently been engaged in levels that I think this is something that needs everybody's brain. We need lots of perspectives. We need a diverse suite of skills. Um, that said, I think, um, you know, the focus is always on the Colorado River to um, to Bill's point that, you know, it, it's two nations, it's seven states, it's a, a number of tribes. Um, it's a complicated one. And it's it's a huge part of our food system. Um, you know, most most of our fruits and vegetables are coming from the um, California and Arizona. So it's it's understandable why it's a really important part of the conversation, but we have many river compacts, particularly across the West. And there are a lot of lawsuits and there are a lot of growing pains and different things that are happening across those compacts. So in some ways, I'm an optimist in the sense that there's a lot of opportunities to learn and figure out what's working in these different communities um, as the stresses continue to mount. Um, so I'm I'm hopeful that uh, if we can bring a bunch of different perspectives together and use the lessons learned on different in different watersheds and within different river compacts, we can potentially start to to work at scale. But um, you know, to AG's point, like we have this knowledge for the most part of how we can start to bring all of the different tools in, both the technical and the administrative, but also the land use. Um, and yet we're still grasping at straws to even get everyone at the same table. So I think there's a lot of opportunity, um, but I think that we we as a, as a community, as a nation, and, and quite honestly, across the globe are really struggling with how to adapt real time to, you know, a rapidly changing landscape. Thank you very much. And thank you all panelists for your very illuminating answers to this question. Uh, obviously a lot of directions that we're gonna await to see where this goes, but uh, definitely um, 
things to be optimistic about, maybe things not to be as optimistic about, as you point out. Before we go on to the second question, I want to remind our audience that there is a Q&A uh, box, so you can put questions in, and we'll get to those uh, just as soon as we can. Um, well, cows, crops, and the Colorado. Appropriately, that does suggest agriculture as important. So my next question is as follows. We frequently hear that a new paradigm for water use, particularly for agriculture, is needed to save the Colorado River. Uh, what, in your view, does this new paradigm look like? And what might be the barriers to its adoption? And Brian, why don't we start again with you? Yeah, thanks, David. So um, the um, we recently did a recalculation of the water budget of the entirety of the Colorado River system. So, Bill, we included those the Gila River and the other Arizona tributaries. We included Mexico, and and I think these are probably the the most accurate, complete numbers now. And and hopefully they'll be published soon and be sharing them with all of you. But um, but. The, the numbers are, are not all that different from what you've been hearing in the media and elsewhere. Um, about two thirds of the Colorado River, and I'm talking about all of the water in the Colorado River system, about two thirds of it goes to irrigated agriculture, is consumed by irrigated agriculture. And about 20% goes to urban areas, municipal, industrial, commercial uses. And, um, but I think it's really, really unfortunate um, and, and I hate hearing the vilification of farmers um, because of those statistics that, you know, one of my colleagues referred to it as a circular firing squad. You know, the, the cities are pointing the finger, the urbanites are pointing the fingers at the farmers and the ranchers and the ranchers and farmers are pointing the fingers at the fountains and the swimming pools and the, and the golf courses. I don't think that's very productive. And I think we need to we, we need to stop doing that, you know, with each other. Um, and really start to look at this in, in a much more objective and collaborative manner. Um, agriculture does get a lot of attention um, in this problem, and hence the title of the colloquium, David, uh, because it is, you know, the big water user, more than three times, um, agriculture uses more than three times all the water used for all other purposes. Um, and so that suggests, of course, that we have to take a good hard look at irrigated ag. And we also have to take a good hard look at, at the urban water uses. Uh, there's some good news, um, particularly on the urban side, the cities, uh, we just completed a, a very um, ambitious project last year where we looked at um, cities dependent upon the Colorado River uh, as, as part of their water supply, including some of the Southern California cities, some of the, and Denver and some of the Front Range cities. And the numbers were very impressive. Uh, the population increased by about 24% over the last couple of decades, and yet their water use actually declined by 18%. So it didn't just stay steady while they grew by, by a quarter, it actually went down by 18%. So that's good news. The cities are working pretty hard. But the bad news is, you know, we have to really come to grips with the fact that in total, we are collectively using as Bill said, you know, a million and a half acre feet too much, million acre feet too much, that might be 15 to 20% too much, uh, more than the river is delivering. And so we've got to figure out some way to get out of that bind. And um, I think there are a lot of opportunities for, uh, for some innovation and for some change out in the agricultural landscape. We've been taking a good hard look at um, uh, some of the opportunities presented by shifting to alternative crops and uh, and hopefully that work will be published soon as well. But there's there's some pretty substantial numbers there. There's some real potential there that keeps the farmers incomes whole. That was one of the constraints we placed on the analysis um, and, and yet saves, you know, a pretty substantial volume of water. So I think there's some real opportunities there. I'd be happy to share some details with anybody during the Q&A or afterwards, um, hopefully they can, uh, we can distribute our emails and, and for any follow up, David, but, um, you know, I think, I think we all need to be in this together. We all, you know, both the cities and the farms are, are going to need to really figure out some way to, uh, to cut the water use by 15 to 20% now, and it's going to get more challenging with the changing climate going into the future decades. Thank you, Brian. Bill Hazenkamp. 
Thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna push back a little bit on Brian and maybe the rest of my panelists. Not the first time. And, <laughs> and push back on the news and the media. Uh, I think the general perception of the Colorado River, if you were to talk to most people or most stories, is water managers have stood around watching the reservoir levels crash. We've haven't responded, and now there's a crisis. We have to take dramatic action today, or the reservoirs are hit Deadpool. I want to go back to 1949. 1949, what happened in 49? East and West Germany split, became two countries. The NBA was formed. And 1949 is the last time that the state of California used as little Colorado River water as it's using this year. This year, our demands are at a record low level already. Much so, we are, you know, California went from 5.2 down to 4.4 million acre foot 20 years ago. This year, we're on track to use 3.7 million acre foot, 700 less. So that's a million and a half acre foot less this year than we used in 2002. And that's from all sectors. Metropolitan, our region here, 20 years ago, had a demand for imported water of 2 million acre feet from both the state project and the Colorado River. This year, it's 1.2 million acre feet, despite adding another million people over the last 20 years. But it's the sit urban entities, ag entities have also stepped up. IID, the largest user in the basin, was using 3.1. This year, they're 2.4. IID alone is down 700,000 acre feet. And it doesn't stop in California. Uh, Arizona, Nevada, Las Vegas is using under 200,000. Their allocation is 300,000. Arizona's use and Mexico's use is all down for a lower basin use of almost 2 million acre feet under the amount that is allocated under the compact and the Mexico treaty. So we certainly have responded as states. And as a result, the storage is 6 million acre feet higher this year than it was last year. Some of that from the big snow, but a lot of that from reduced demand. So we have been ramping up and, and there's not, we don't have to make a radical change overnight. The farmers are smart. They know how to reduce use. That's where most of the savings has to come. Urban entities have to step up. Las Vegas has stepped up banning non-functional turf and getting rid of th their fight on grass. We are changing. The question is, do we have to make a radical change over the next two and a half years? We certainly have to repair for it. How radical it has to change that time will tell because we have been making big strides in living with less water. Thank you, Bill. A.G. Kamalamura. Uh, I always like to use that analogy of the glass half full or the glass half empty. And it, it really depends on well, what's in the pitcher that you're pouring from. So if you're pitching, pouring fear, guess what? Your glass is half empty. And this crisis that we're in, you know, and arguably, again, seven months ago, we, we were really starting to see the wheels come off had it been a, an enormously dry year for California, and that that's for the whole state. That's not just Colorado. Um, that being said, we started to see because of those predictable consequences of reservoirs emptying out, hitting Deadpool, all those type of things playing out, we were being forced to, to, to act. Um, this idea of a glass half full, though, is if you've got a lot of potential, a lot of possibilities, a lot of opportunities to change the way we're doing things, that's great. But what happens a lot of times is we're precluded from doing those things because nobody really wants to see positive change. Maybe they like the fact that we're in crisis. Maybe they make money out of the fear in the crisis. Um, and I say that somewhat skeptically, you know, cynically, um, but I, I'll do this to say this we don't really have the luxury of being uh, allowing this to be a think tank kind of operation anymore. We have to get into our minds that we're in a do tank time, uh, that we want to get things done uh, with what we know. I talk about the toolbox all the time. It's amazing how many new tools are in the box that that uh, allow every city on the, in, in, in this region of the seven states, for example, to go into a, a water reuse, re reclamation water reuse and water re reclaim water with really good s solutions and really good filtration that allows us to put that water back to use instead of sending it on back downstream. We know that we uh, can harvest water from the atmosphere. 
Uh, if you have a renewable energy source, atmospheric water harvest is something that could happen with any house anywhere um, and, and actually create a pretty good supply of water for every household there is. Um, we recognize that in taking um, uh, these uh, plants that would have uh, are drought tolerant that uh, can rely on saltier water. That's an opportunity for us to really look at the kind of water we would use. This idea that we could take um, brackish water out of some of these aquifers that currently have we can't access. There's some great filtration that actually takes the minor elements out of those aquifers of brackish water and becomes actually commercially commercial grade minerals that you can use. And suddenly the byproduct is good water, good water for irrigation coming out of some of these aquifers that we haven't been able to ta tackle, partly because it's an energy intensive process to pull the minerals out. But now that we have different renewable energy uh, opportunities, we can do that and pull the water, uh, clean up those water basins and actually start using other kinds of water in, in a number of places. Uh, and th that amount of water is enormous. So that goes back to this uh, this, this this observation we have a lot of opportunities to put into play if our imagination can envision it. The The reality is um, the feasibility of it is better than ever before. And why wouldn't we start to look at uh, basin by basin, watershed by watershed, the different solutions that fit for each one, not a one size fits all for all watersheds. I, I think it's just very simple to understand that there's plenty to be done and if we're going to sit on our hands and think about it or uh, or be halted in our, our ability to move forward because of somebody's regulatory framework that doesn't allow for progress, um, that's where some of the problem lies is we've put ourselves, whether it's CEQA, whether it's whatever the different framework that doesn't allow for progress, uh, we could cite that we have a, an emergency which should be able to uh, at least um, accelerate our ability to put some of these projects into play uh, instead of having them stalled and, and, and the lawyers, of course, than fighting to make a living. Um, I'm not too happy with those, uh, the the livelihoods of the non-productive being so, so well rewarded when we have a lot of work to do. And, and excuse my cynicism, but uh, it, it really is time for us to get working on these projects. And Metropolitan is a good example of uh, an organization that has been constantly trying to figure out how to get down there 10, 20 years down the future and even beyond. So we've got a lot of work to do, but it, it can be done. It's sad when we get stalled. Thank you, A.G. Appreciate your candor, by the way. So it makes these panels great. Uh, Christy, let's go to you. And so I think there's been a ton of elaboration on on the different ways that we can get out of this uh, or at least improve the situation, largely technological. Um, and so what, what I think about in our line of work and thinking about regenerative agriculture is how do we do more with less and particularly with water, right? And so are there systems that maybe we're not utilizing today ecologically or or ones that maybe we've lost because of the historical management of a lot of this land out west? Um, and so how do we make the soils healthier? You know, not just not just uh, cover the soils, but actually rebuild soil. I mean, there's there's some pretty incredible work being done Um where people are using regenerative practices, they're doing tons of cover crops, they're doing multi-species grazing, and they're actually building soil at like centimeters uh, at a time, which geologists didn't think was possible, and now they're doing it. Um, and the water retention of those soils is incredible. And so when you get these massive storms, like California has been seeing with the tropical storm and much of the, the Northern Midwest has been seeing, Suddenly, the practitioners of these regenerative uh, practices, they don't have standing water in their fields, which then just kind of waterlogs uh, things, floods their crops, uh, eventually evaporates and doesn't go into the system in general. Um, and so by creating healthier soils, which then increases the biomass of the soil uh, funguses and the bacteria. And then that's like a carbon sequestration sink. Like there's there's all kinds of added benefits to thinking about the systems that we're living within um, and creating soils that can be sponges so that, you know, we're not having these flood events where a lot of the water is going out to the ocean, but we're having consistent release of water in these systems so that we don't get saltwater intrusion either. Going back to some of the historical flows, 
Um, and I think a huge thing that we don't talk a lot about um, is the evaporation off of reservoirs, right? So, I mean, the the amount of water that evaporates off of the, the holding systems within the Colorado is mind boggling. And while it's you know beneficial to have some moisture in the air, these are not really natural environments for that kind of amount of that surface area to be available for evaporation. So thinking about keeping the water in the soil so that it slowly releases instead of sitting in a retention pond that is evaporating, I think there's a ton of opportunities, but we really have to be thinking about the upstream effects um, and the surrounding watersheds that are feeding it. And so to the title about you know cows and crops and water, and I think that livestock in general, not just cattle, but livestock in general really present an opportunity for thoughtful regenerative grazing. It, they can definitely be destructive. There's no question about that. Like grazing can be bad, but grazing can be good. And so figuring out how do we work with the working lands of the West, the ranches and the federal lands that are in grazing allotments, how do we work with those partners in ways that can benefit the whole water system? Well, thank you. Thank you to all the panelists for your very uh, illuminating answers and perspectives on this. Uh, as promised, uh, I did want to encourage our audience to put questions into the chat. We do have a couple of questions pending, and I'm just going to go ahead and pitch them to the panelists. Uh, Carol Moore asks, the reuse of water, such as through recycling and direct potable reuse, are changing the dynamics. As those investments increase, there will be more. Isn't that included? More, I said, more water. Isn't that included? Um, who'd like to uh, answer that, at least initially? We'll go around. Go ahead, Ag. Uh, I've been fortunate. I I farm in the uh, Irvine um, Irvine Water District area. Uh, for the last uh, almost all my life, we've been there since 1958. I was two or three when I moved in the area. Uh, we moved in the area, but we were fortunate about 30 plus years ago to be one of the early adopters to be able to use reclaim water. And at that early stage, even though the filtration was a uh, very high level, um, there was a lot of pushback because of what the, the fear that it would be dirty water. Um, and certainly we understand the difference between gray water, the distance, you know, for tertiary, secondary treated water. And so there's a, 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 a danger point there. And even today, as we understand, there's all kinds of contaminants that you can now detect at the parts per trillion level. Um, it's making everybody in the in the industry rethink and relook at how 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 they can create clean water. But it's interesting what's whether it's water coming up out of a well or whether what water coming through the system, this goes back to the tools we have to clean it up so that we could use it. And whether we're using it for uh, horticulture or agriculture, whether we're using it for potable reuse, um, we're right there where it's more than possible because it's being done already on the planet. So it's not as if the, uh, the, the technology is not ready to go. It's the acceptance sometimes is not ready to go. But be, because the, the public generally is not aware that reusable water, reclaimed water has been in play for over 30, 35 years uh, and actually done well uh, with that as a uh, as an augmentation to the general water supply. That's, I think, where we're, there's a, a lot of excitement that it's off the shelf, ready to go, improved as we go with, you know, every decade, it gets better and better. And the squeamishness about how we use our water, um, believe me, it, it's more of uh, uh, how, what a miracle it is that we can work with water in so many wonderful ways. Yeah, if I could just add, um, yeah, we recycle about 400,000 acre feet a year in our service area. Um, that's, you know, if our demand for imported water is 1.2, it would have been 1.6, but we recycle 400,000. Uh, we are now embarking on the largest water recycling plan in the nation with Pure Water Southern California. At build that would be about 160,000 acre feet of new water, further reducing demand for imported water. On top of that, City of LA is uh, going forward with uh, uh, Operation Next to recycle water from Hyperion. San Diego is doing pure water, San Diego. Uh, so we uh, have ambitious goals to recycle significantly more water. There, there are limits, you can't re keep recycling forever, but certainly there's a lot more we can do and we are planning on doing that. And that will help us take even less water from the Colorado River in the future. And it's certainly part of the plan. 
other thoughts, Brian or Christy? Well, you know, to, to sort of more directly um, to um, to Carol's question, you know, Carol, we can think about this as the reuse and recycling. We, we can either think about it as adding water to the system, and that's been, um, you know, that's been one way that a lot of these cities have been able to support their additional growth. I was talking about over the last couple of decades, um, using other sources of water, like reuse water, recycled water, um, has been one way of helping to meet some of the water requirements of that growth without having to tap into existing water sources like the Colorado River. Um, I'd also like to see a lot of the cities that um, maybe they're not growing so fast, also investing heavily in, in some of those kinds of technologies because then they can actually decrease the amount of water that they're taking out of out of the Colorado River system. So either way, it either helps to offset some of the growth or it can reduce the amount that we're having to take out of the Colorado River. It's a it's definitely I'm, I'm glad you raise it, Carol. It's, it's definitely something that needs to be um, invested in very, very heavily. And to to AG's points, you know, whatever it takes to expedite that, let's let's go for it. Christy, any thoughts on this? No, I think they've done a good job covering it. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from Michael Cohn. It's directed specifically to Bill Hazenkamp. And so uh, we'll let you answer it first, Bill. And if others would also like to amplify, uh, we'll so go there. The question is, per the decree accounting reports, California consumed more than 4.4 million acre feet in both 2021 and 2022. This year's dramatic reduction seems to be a result of the 100% state water project allocation and recent storms in Imperial and Coachella. Is that not right, Bill? Yeah, so it's, it's difficult to see trends by looking at one year. Um, and if you look at the long-term trend, I think that tells the story. And the long-term trend is we add water to Lake Mead in wet years in our region and then take water out in dry years. Um, but because our demand for water has been going down, 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 the amount we put in in a year like this is 400,000 acre feet or more. And in the dry year, the amount we pull out is maybe 50 to 100,000 acre feet. So we, we put in and take out about equal frequency, but when we put in, we put in a lot. And when we take out, we take out a little. And as a result, by the end of this year, the nets put into Lake Mead is gonna be about 1.6 million acre feet of conserved water that we could have used, but because of our reduced demand, that is in Lake Mead, that's over 20 feet in Lake Mead from water that gets there in slugs, but it's all of a, re uh, a result of reduced demand in our region. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other panelists would like to respond, amplify? Okay. Uh, we have an anonymous attendee. Uh, in Central California, there's been a lot of meetings and actions on how much water is or can be used in farms and ranches. I understand some satellite information, I assume meant here is remote sensing. Uh, information by satellite uh, is or can be used uh, in farms. Uh, some satellite information is used to identify how much water is used. Is this method to identify water usage by farmers and ranchers really accurate? It's a technical question. It's an important one. Um, is, that, is that the best, most accurate and accurate way of determining how much water is really available and how much is used? I'd be able to say yes and no, um, you know, for a good producer, whether you're producing crops or animals or orchards or, you know, the idea of under irrigating is, is basically immediately a bad idea uh, under underwatering your, your livestock uh, immediately has negative impacts and, and uh, underwatering or under uh, hydrating your brand new young plants causes a, a, a long lasting damage. So any farmer, uh, whether you're using data for uh, uh, um, for monitoring your water use. Um, if you're going to err on one side, you would err on the side of a little more water than what you would normally could use. Anytime you can save water, however, especially in so many areas where now water is so expensive, uh, it, the natural 
um, incentive is to save the water. Don't be wasting water because it's just money flowing out of your pocket. And, and in agriculture these days here in 2023, you know, it, it's not 20. 2000 it's not 1980 it's not we're, we're for those that and, and actually there's plenty of guys that still furrow irrigate and use uh, water op, op, open open uh, furrow uh, flooding field flooding but you might note that all those fields have been laser leveled uh, because they want to do it efficiently uh, you might notice that all of us that use drip irrigation is because it, it, the, there's better end results. Most farmers will invest, most ranchers will invest in any technology that gives them a higher uh, predictability of a positive outcome. So whether it's a new water system, whether it's a new uh, monitoring systems, and they can see that their savings there, you can see that they're putting those into play as we speak and, and trying to get that last bit of production out of that last drop of water um, is by by all all mm, if in a modern agricultural society, which we have generally, is, is the goal of every farmer out there. So this idea that the farmers are wasting water intentionally, um, I, I'd be the first to say, OK, there may be a few out there that just kind of don't see it or don't care about it that much. But by and by, um, overwatering uh, to the point where you're losing your soil, not a good thing. Overwatering where you impact your plants, not a good thing, but underwatering again is the other side of that. So when people come out and be, say prescriptively, oh, this is how much water you should use, why would you think that they would be the ones to be able to tell a good farmer the right amount of water unless they can prove it in their fields with a new variety, a new technology, a new technique? Um, it, 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 this is an ongoing trial, if you will, for us as farmers every year, trying to see what we can do better. In, in terms of getting more productivity for that drop of water we're going to use. And that's what's kind of a little bit alarming how often it is that you hear this prescriptive concept that someone on top is going to be the water czar that tells you what kind of crop you can grow and then also what kind of water, uh, how much water you're going to use uh, in a prescriptive way where every single season you have a different set of circumstances that will prescribe that you want to uh, not water ahead of a storm, uh, water, in head of, water uh, ahead of a heat spell. You know, it, it's just hard to believe that um, the ag community that we have today in all these states that are still in business are are are, are not stewards of the, not only of their land and their water. That's my observation. Well, thank you for that. Any further comments? Well, David, I, I guess I'll just jump in quickly since I'm a water number geek. Um, the question was really about the remote sensing and whether that's accurate. And and you know my response would be it's as it's as good as we have at this point. So ideally, we would have monitors measuring equipment on every single canal that diverts water, you know, out of a river, and every ditch that goes onto individual farmers' fields. But you know, we're nowhere near that. We're, you know, probably less by far less than five percent um, of farms are being measured, you know, in that kind of a physical way, actually on the farm field. And so we have to rely on these other kind of, of measurements uh, and they're, they're pretty darn good. They're getting better all the time. Um, and the, the use of the, of the remote imagery is getting to be um, more and more accurate. And so I would just say it's as good as we've got now. So those are, those are kind of like the state of the art for the time, state of the science for the time being. Great, any further comments on that? I just make sometimes we get enamored with the latest newest uh, technology that comes out you know the emperor's new technology is what we kind of call it like like yeah. sometimes like there's amazing applications for drones and at the same time there's wonderful uses for drones that are just make you feel good but at the same time we're, we're this this avalanche if you will a cascade of new ways to measure things and do things it's important and it's exciting but at the same time with a with an asterisk that uh, what does it, how does it ha help the, how does, how does it help the, the user, right? Great yeah. point. So I agree with Brian there. Great point. So uh, we've got one final question that I'm going to pose to the panel, and it's a question, it's a good segue actually from what uh, your comments just uh, suggested about tools and their accuracy and their precision. So I'll ask if you could maybe speak uh, uh, just quickly. Uh, on this question and uh, also use it as a way of any closing comments you'd like to make. Some panelists have mentioned the great tools that are available to cope with Colorado River Basin water issues. Are there any tools you wish existed but don't yet? I'll, I'll start and finish. 
and it's a subject change. We sit offshore of an enormous body of water. It happens to be the Pacific Ocean. And I, I would always wonder, how is it possible, uh, uh, in addition to the water that's in the atmosphere, that we think we have a water problem? And the idea that you could potentially, just think about it, store an enormous amount of fresh water out in the ocean, like a, like a water balloon floating in a bathtub or something. The, there's all kinds of reasons to think that, wow, we could actually solve our water issue problems if we could just utilize that enormous body of water that we sit next to. Uh, and think of different ways, uh, the engineering that would need to be done, the the way to create a, a whether it's a reservoir out in the ocean with a membrane that just separates the two. Why, why don't we think about these other opportunities to deal with water? And the reason is, well, that's not the water business that exists. That would be a different kind of water business. Other closing thoughts? Yeah, my tools are more uh, legal and policy tools. I think that the farm community has demonstrated they know how to conserve water. IID's done a lot of things to be more efficient. Um, we've paid farmers in the partnered with farmers in Bard Water District to not grow summer crops and focus on their vegetables where it may, may make most of the money. But the concern I have is right now the federal government is paying a lot of money, billions of dollars for the agricultural communities to reduce their use. And what we've seen is the unintended consequences. There's been some Wall Street firms and other water hedge fund people buying land, not for farming. They'll farm it for a while, but their main purpose is to make money off of selling the water. And it also, when you pay a lot of money for people to use less, that incentivizes new land to go into production that maybe hasn't been eligible just because you can't operate it at a, uh, at a profit. But people will, would be willing to lose money farming just so they can sell it. So if there were some tools to uh, let the incentivize farmers to use less while not also having paying so that there is this disincentive for others to use more so that they could cash in on that. So more legal tools, maybe defining beneficial use and letting farmers really and and cities use less water without the unintended consequence of trying to cash in in a way that is counterproductive. Excellent. Brian, yes, uh, well, I'll, I'll venture in uh, timidly uh, with uh, with Bill referring to the legal and the policy. So yeah, yeah, the, what I wish and I've said this repeatedly already in this in this colloquium, David, is is for us to learn how to live within our within within the availability of water, you know, living, living within the limits of water availability. And the legal construct for that is called a cap. It's a limit on the total amount of water that can be consumptively used. Um, and the Colorado River Compact 100 years ago, in essence, tried to set a cap, but it was, but as we all know, it was too high. And we now have a much better idea as how much water is available. So we should be setting a cap on how much water is going to get consumed within the overall basin and there ought to be a cap on the upper basin and on the lower basin as well and i bring that up and wanted to close with that david simply because in the places that have effectively applied that kind of a legal limitation on the total amount of water that gets used what you see is an explosion of innovation that once people realize and come to grips at like this is this is all the water we're going to be able to use and we better figure out how to do that um water conservation just takes off um technologies take off and it's just really it becomes um it becomes an accelerator frankly for all kinds of innovation and uh, and new ideas and i hope that the negotiators on the colorado take that into serious consideration um there's lots of great examples from around the world that i'd be happy to share with anybody who's interested great and by the way before we go to christy for wrap up I just want to add, uh, we'll, uh, if we can make sure that all of the participants have your email contacts so they can uh, communicate with you offline if they have further questions, amplification on things that you've uh, talked about or things that they would like you to uh, explore with them. Uh, if that's all right, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and do that. Christy, over to you. So thinking about some of the technology in our world of regenerative grazing, um, 
we're at the very beginning of virtual fencing. And I think that that is a tool that will probably play into all land management, um, particularly thinking about like protecting water, you know, like riparian habitat, which has got, you know, critical filtering and ecological functions, while also like intensifying the beneficial impact in rangelands in timing and space and all of the different factors that go into thinking about how you're going to graze something. So there's very early successes with uh, some of this virtual fencing where you can put collars on cattle um, and literally from your computer control the 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 fence line that they will be contained in. Um, it's having worked with a lot of like GIS technology over my career, I think it's still very much in its early days and it's got its glitches, but I see huge potential for that because then you could start to use goats in forested landscapes for wildfire mitigation um, that would then protect the forests in the next fire. And so we wouldn't have these huge watershed impacts. So I think thinking about technology and opportunities for new things, I think there's a lot of opportunity for using technology to complement the grazing um, activities that we should be doing in all these upper watersheds. Wonderful. I wish we could go on for at least another hour, but uh, we want to be respectful of uh, you, the panelists, and and all of the acti uh, all of the uh, initiative that you've taken in in preparing for this panel. It's been really wonderful, very illuminating. I want to remind everyone that this has been recorded, so it is or will be preserved for posterity on the Water UCI homepage. Uh, again, your contact information will be available for uh, people in the audience and beyond who'd like to continue this conversation offline, and we certainly encourage them. Uh, and then just a couple of other wrap-up items. Uh, we will uh, be sending around information on future Water UCI Speaking of Water series events. We will have them throughout the year. We certainly invite all of you who attended this panel to uh, participate in the audience for that one as well. We would relish that, welcome it. And lastly, again, this has just been a wonderfully illuminating panel, uh, really bringing order and reason and thought and a civil conversation to an issue that many, many people throughout the region are uh, very fired up about. And it's refreshing to have that kind of a discussion. So I want to thank Brian, Christy, AG, and Bill for a wonderful discussion. And again, thank you for making the time to share your knowledge and your insights and your information with Water UCI. Thank you all. Mm. Thank you, yep. David. Thank you. Bye-bye.